welcome to IGM. We're delighted again to host Agile TO and looking forward to the speaker and activities tonight and mingling with all of you. Morning. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you to all of our all of our sponsors, uh, especially you guys for for uh, for the venue. It is absolutely amazing that we get such a beautiful place, uh, and you guys take great care of us. So thank you so much. Uh, shout it as well to the organizing team who uh, who pull these things together. Uh, and speaking of the organizing team, there are opportunities if you'd like to help organize these events. Uh, I'll tell you how desperate we are for organizers. Um, we are so desperate that we've had to ask Jeff to do the introductions tonight. And you know you're desperate when that's happening. So if, if you'd like to get involved, if you have some speakers or some people you know in the community or you'd like to help organize these events, please reach out to Tom or John sitting at the back there. Um, they are uh, they are currently uh, two two of the uh, two of the organizers that are representing here, and they'd love to uh, they'd love to talk to you about getting involved. Um, but it's my pleasure tonight. Nobody came here to hear me uh, talk. Although if you did, I can keep going. Um, but I. <laughs> I know you didn't. So what I'd like to do is in, in introduce you to a, a friend of mine, a guy I got to meet, I don't know, something like three years ago, right before the pandemic hit. Uh, Brian and I had the opportunity to work together. And, uh, and, and I just fell in love with the guy. He's absolutely amazing and an incredible wealth of knowledge and firsthand experience. He's going to do a little bit of an introduction on himself on some of the, uh, some of the roles and some of the companies that he's had. But it's just been amazing to, uh, to be able to learn from him. And uh, so when he got fired a couple months ago, I thought... <laughs> I thought, what a great opportunity to have him come up to Toronto and speak to us about his failures, uh, his experiences, um, and uh, and give us an opportunity to learn from him. And he's not wrong when we're going to talk about directionally correct but usefully wrong uh, things. What I will say is that knowing uh, Brian, it's probably going to be more of a conversation than a presentation. So if you'd like to come and move closer and, and join in the conversation, please feel free to do so. Uh, but absolutely great guy. Please welcome uh, Brian. Thank you. Two microphones a problem? We all know that failure means learning, right? Jeff, thank you for pointing that out in front of everyone. Um, again, really, thanks for having me here today. Um, I, I am um, happily unemployed for three months, was looking for something to do. Jeff said, hey, we're starting up the meetup. Why don't you come up? I'm like, awesome. What am I going to talk about? I don't know. So I've been working on this talk about something that I'm really passionate about, and it's this idea of helping people realize that Agile is not a bunch of rules. It needs to be about the mindset. And so I think you guys are all in the space. You're going to agree with me with a lot of things. So hopefully, like Jeff said, I'm going to take this down a notch and I'm not going to PowerPoint you to death. I just want to have a conversation to kind of help us all learn from each other. Um, this idea of not being perfect is so important because it forces us to actually learn the aspects of the mindset. So that's what I'm going to try and convince us all today, that um, we can be directionally correct and usefully wrong to, uh, to make progress and make sure that we're not uh, dotting I's and crossing T's too tightly because it kind of gets us off. It turns us into mechanical agile instead of actually doing it for the right reasons. Um, so I am going to just briefly introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am much like uh, the title of the talk. I am absolutely imperfect myself. I am not polished around the edges. If you were expecting me to be a perfect presenter today here, I'm not the right guy. But uh, I'm happy to just share my experiences and ask good questions. And hopefully we can figure out a way to learn something together. Um, I um, There's a reference to Jeff on this slide if you look closely enough. Um, I've worked with a lot of different Agile coaches. I don't want to go too deep on this, but um, I just gave a very similar talk yesterday in Pittsburgh. Um, you have to forgive me. I woke up at 4 a.m. yesterday, drove to Pittsburgh to speak at Pitt Agile, drove to Buffalo to go drink with some of my old friends in Buffalo, got up this morning and came up to Toronto. So I am, like, on it. Um, but this is, like, what happened to me. I started off as a software developer at a college, and uh, I was a consultant for, like, 13 years on the road. And then I learned how to become a CTO. That kind of set me up to be a CTO. And the only reason that I tell this whole story, um, I'm going to give you the abbreviated version of it, is because I learned how to be agile accidentally. I was managing one of the world's largest Web 2.0 startups in San Francisco um, out of an Excel spreadsheet. And I hired a guy from Yahoo, Yahoo Travel. He's like, you know that spreadsheet? That's your backlog. I'm like, oh, cool. You know the process you do? That's prioritization. That's, that's your product roadmap. You know how you put your 
software developers and your testers together in the same team, and you use that cruise control app with the ThoughtWorks consultants to try and actually push code every day, that's CICD, that's DevOps. I had no idea what any of these words were. We were just kind of doing them accidentally. And so I felt like I learned on the job without knowing any of the mechanics, without knowing what the word scrum was or anything. I just sort of learned organically. And so as a coach, that's my style. I try to help people just connect with the reasons why you do these things and not like the rules and the vocabulary and the vernacular that people get hung up on. The same thing sort of true about the way I stumbled into agile transformations. So after being a CTO and getting fired and losing all kinds of money for these startups, I, um, I got hired to work at Dell Software that um, uh, asked me to build a startup from scratch. It was actually a startup inside of Dell Software, and they wanted me to build a startup by hiring a team, writing all this code. And so I did what I know I know how to do. I hired a bunch of people, and I um, went one week sprints, and we launched uh, kind of an MVP of a product in ten weeks. And the people at Dell about lost their minds. They're like, "How the heck did you do that?" I'm like, "Well, this is what Agile is. You just iterate quickly, ask your customers what they need, you build only the most important things, and you push code as quickly as you can, and you get feedback." They're like, that's amazing. Can you teach everyone else how to do that? So they started flying me all around the country trying to teach everybody, a couple hundred software engineers in this division of Dell, about how to actually be agile. So you can imagine how many times I did the marshmallow challenge all around the country. It was pretty fun. Um, but that was my first sort of agile transformation of sorts, teaching an entire division of this company about how to be agile and use the principles. I worked at CIS, and most recently, um, CIS is a big company. It was responsible for like 60 teams. My only real interesting caveat or interesting story from there is I convinced the CTO to stop having anybody log time. I felt like such a big win. Have you ever done that before? My God, it feels good. And everybody loves you because they're not logging their stupid time anymore. I'm like, we have a spreadsheet. There's headcount. You know how many people are on how many teams. Let's just put the team names on the board. Do you still want to have this product? Are you in two or three uh, teams next quarter? Great. Then that's our lean portfolio management. Anyway, so I spent the last four and a half years, as Jeff said, out at M&T Bank, kind of the biggest transformation. We had almost a dozen coaches on the team at one point. A handful of friends here from Toronto came down to work with us in Buffalo, and it was amazing. We had uh, kind of top-down support, 300 teams, working with the business, radically transforming, even finance now they're working on actually changing their budgeting strategy. So it's all the sort of stuff that you want a company to work on, business agility. It's really rewarding to, to work there. And like I said, I had a lot of really smart people around me, so I learned a lot, um, even from people like Jeff, who's very humble, but has a lot to share. I learned a lot from you, Jeff, as well. Um, and I like to tell people, there's a thousand ways to become an Agile coach. And I worked with car salesmen, you know, George, uh, a hypnotist, you guys know probably exactly who I'm talking about when I say a hypnotist from the Toronto area, he now lives out in west coast of Toronto, I mean uh, west coast of Canada. Um, a physics professor, you guys might even know who that is, Paul Carvalho. Hypnotist is Mike Bowler. Of course, Jeff the Magician, um, all kinds of different people, different walks of life. Um, hockey coach, you guys might know the hockey coach too, um, Brian Beecham. But all these different things mean you can, you can come to this stuff from any different direction. So the premise of the talk today is OKRs, user stories, it doesn't matter. If you do it right, we're going to get to what the Agile mindset is. Now, I, usually, I, I assume everyone knows what I mean when I say the Agile mindset. But if you search for, you're not going to find this anywhere on the internet except like on my blog. I, I like all good coaches stole this from somewhere else on the internet and kind of glued it together and re-spit it out in my own words. The Agile mindset is this moment when it clicks for people, right? You see it when it works, right? You know when they don't have the mindset. you got a mechanical scrum team or something just not doing the things right. But to me, the mindset means you actually are building stuff iteratively. You know that you're making progress slowly. You have a product culture. You're worried about actually building products and focusing less on projects. Um, you're customer-centric in everything you do. You have a culture of learning. You create space for innovation. You actually allow people to actually do um, learning on the job, learn from each other, transfer skills. 
you incorporate things like design thinking and experimentation and allow people to actually explore their problem spaces, make sure they're solving the right problems, and treat their requirements like hypotheses, being data-centric about trying to deliver work, um, always trying to improve what they work on. And of course, none of this is possible unless you have some psychological safety. So when I say agile mindset, this is what it means to me. Does it resonate with anybody? Does it feel like it makes sense? But Am I wrong? Like, it's not written down anywhere really clearly on the internet, is it? I mean, besides reading Gill's book, like, what, what else is the authoritative source of what defines the Agile mindset? Anyone know something I'm missing of? Weird, right? We just assume, coaches just assume we know what it means. So anyway, this is, so my, my theory tonight is instead of actually um, presenting my next 30 slides, I'm going to turn it into like bullets and have a conversation with you all to see what you all think. And then I'm going to have one small exercise and I'll give you, instead of surprising it with you later, I'm going to tell you what it is up front. We're going to go over the stuff about OKRs and user stories and about how you need to figure out how to make progress, not focus on perfection. And then what I'm going to ask you all to do is to break up into groups and to help kind of itemize some of the things we've discussed today and correlate it back to what are the things that actually uh, you do to embrace the Agile mindset while working on OKRs and user stories? I'll explain it more clearly later. Um, I inserted this just an hour ago because I feel like I owe you an explanation about some of the assumptions that I made working on this, just big picture things, um, things that I believe, and hopefully you guys do too, so call me out if you don't. I think if you spend too much time estimating, you deliver less value. It feels obviously, it feels obvious, right? But has anyone seen a team spend more than a day in sprint planning? It happens. Estimating, spend a couple hours estimating, getting ready for the next sprint, arguing about how big tiny little tasks are, a little bit. Yeah, okay, very good. <laughs> Hashtag no estimates, I'm with you. Um, and so being agile um, should be less about making specific predictions and just promising that you're going to deliver the most important stuff sooner. Like that's really the spirit of this stuff, right? This is what I believe in my heart. This is why we do these things. Trying to be precise is a fool's errand. It's like you're missing the point if you're trying to get too specific about things. And Actually being directionally correct, usefully wrong, helps us focus on the Agile mindset. That's my premise. This is my one slide on OKRs. You can have a vision and a strategy. OKRs are not your vision and strategy. They're the vehicle through which you embody the vision and the strategy. And the O stands for objective. This is your big, let's say huge audacious goal. Some people have a different way of saying that BHAG acronym, but I like beautiful, big, huge audacious goal and probably longer time frame. And then the KRs are the key results, the actual descriptions of what measures are you going to try and achieve in a shorter time frame in order to work towards that big objective. And so in general, in the blue box there, you got OKRs are this general goal setting technique to try and create alignment and engagement to actually focus on the right goals and track the outcomes. That's how I describe OKRs. Mm -hmm. Could you think of what the key result as the indicators that you're moving towards Yeah, it depends on what actual measures you're using, I think. Okay. But yeah, the the you know increase revenue by ten percent. I guess that is gonna it depends on when you actually, like how you actually measure these things, right? But like, it's the goal that you want to be able to look backwards and say, did we make it or not, right? Um, reduce the number of production errors by 20%. You won't know that until you can actually look backwards and measure it. It's often something like team happiness. It doesn't generate revenue. It doesn't make my customers any happier. But if my team is happier, that's an indication that I might start producing better quality code in the future. That's an indication that I might be able to deliver something in the future. 
So that might be that's my default go to yeah. example. Happiness. Happiness. Okay. As a leading indicator. The team mood. Yeah, because if that's true, then other things will fall into place. So we we have another example. If you need to make this much sales project sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need to have a certain number of sales visits and calls. So yeah, exactly. Those go, are go up the funnel. So that you know that you're going to turn it into actual sales. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Which 10 times the sales visits, right. and then you might have a chance of actually right. increasing sales. Right. Um, and so I think that's that's really good. And so OKRs are this like magical tool, easy to describe, one slide or less, but really hard to master. And you can see how slippery it is, right? You can see all the different ways that you might orchestrate a strategy described in words with your objectives and key results. I'm going to ask you guys some questions about this because there's lots of sort of rules and intuitions about what you yeah, might do with them. Yeah. Just before you go on, that was a perfect example, right? The objective is to increase sales. I want to increase sales of my company. That's the long-term objective, and I want to do it for a variety of reasons. What, right? But that might be my long-term objective. My key result this quarter, all I'm going to worry about this quarter, is having more appointments with potential clients. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. That doesn't get me more sales, but that's my first key result in moving towards more sales. Right. Thank yeah. you. Great example. And it would take some great leadership and foresight to come up with that plan in order to make sure you're heading in the right direction. A lot of the reason why we put OKRs in place in the first place is to create the curves of the road about where people should focus. So you're correct me now because you have many key results in order to accomplish the objective. Yes. yes. So that's no, yeah, and there's some magic. There's there's a, a magic formula about how many you should have. There's no right and wrong answer, but yeah, it's magic to try and figure out exactly how many to have. Yeah. <laughs> Just as always, three to five. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah. So all right, so we covered what OKRs are. And just high level of you know what what it is objective and key results great so if I was going to ask though so we can speculate about this a little bit but get creative with me here for a second why do you think these things even exist why do you think we use them yeah yeah big boss read a book on them and all of a sudden we got to do OKRs why else. Yeah. Yeah, alignment. So if we have this one north star about what the heck we said we're going to do, then people will be focused on those things. And it's declared up here, and the teams have to decide what they're going to do to actually deliver against those goals. That's alignment, right? It's good. And there's a, a Lewis Carroll quote in there somewhere, right? If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there same kind of a thing and that's at a lower level right like what is this team doing for the next two weeks you're defining the curves of the road you're trying to say this is our short-term goal and the only real you know big picture difference here is that we're talking about different time frames right so if an objective is a much bigger statement then you have to come up with some really big goals that are going to take a while to accomplish and that's you know some companies don't do that right they just well, we're always doing the same thing we always did, so I guess we'll keep doing that. They don't think, what do I have to do to survive this year? What do I have to do to actually make a difference? To move, what needles should we be moving? Who are we? Who do we want to become? And so if you're doing these things right, the OKRs will embody the strategy. Yeah? I'm wondering, so when you're aiming for key results, are you, are you aiming for one at a time? Like when we talk about alignment or when we talk about having multiple results, like what would be the strategy in terms of the process? Right. And so you would imagine one big objective might have multiple key results that could help explain ways that you'll be successful against that big picture goal. And so if your, your big objective might be, you know, let's open up international sales for the first time. It's a pretty big goal for us as a company. Probably a lot of things we have to do in order to be able to do that. One of those key results might be um, you know, establish a presence in Canada. Okay, what does that mean? Probably lots of things. Or it might be just like, you know, have so many sales calls in Toronto, and that will enforce us to find a way to, in order to create a sales channel and a sales funnel internationally. You could, you could read 
One key result might be retain current customers. Yeah. The second one might be gain some new customers, or perhaps purchase a customer base from a company. Awesome. Right? And it could be any of those things. And you would really <coughs> want to put numbers and ranges on them. A key result is meant to have some kind of like actual uh, um, specifics on there. And I think that's one of the questions that I wanted to ask at some point. Um, if it's not fully clear yet, it will be later. Um, so I think I already said this out loud, right? So Jeff Gotthelf, um, great sort of product mind out there, um, likes to remind people this all the time. He runs into clients who think that, well, if we come up with some really good OKRs, that will be our strategy. But the reality is you kind of have to have a strategy or a vision as a company first. Like the, the OKRs are sort of an abstraction of a strategy. And so if the company doesn't know where it's going, then yeah, any road will get you to wherever you're going. You want to actually know what your strategic intent is as a company, and then you can think more cleverly about how can we focus that big picture of who we are and who we want to become and decide what we're doing this quarter. What are we doing this year? And these things are separate for a reason. So the OKRs, while I like to label them as a strategic tool set of sorts, um, should not be a replacement for your actual strategy. Does that make sense? Have you guys seen companies do this before where they kind of use the two synonymous strategy and OKRs? Especially if they don't know what they're doing with strategy, they just jump straight to this. I got a tool, let's just fill out the lean canvas and off we run, right? Um, all right, so here's a question. Should an objective, big goal, be very specific and attainable, or should it be aspirational? What do you guys know about OKRs? It should be stretched. Stretched goals? Okay. okay. But about that, but not very aspirational that, you know, everyone, every end of the field that we fail. Okay. But it has to be so there's sort of about, a range there you're saying, like make yeah, it so it. it's a, attainable but a stretch goal, but not so ridiculous that like we're going to try and land on Mars or something. Okay. <laughs> What were you going to say, Dan? Uh, Wayne, was, Wayne was first. I was going to say yes. Yes. <laughs> they can, they can't <laughs> it can't be either. Yeah. That's great. So it's, and it's what is necessary for your company at the time, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you're walking into a brand new client, consulting with them for the first time, I think I'd probably lean on the aspirational side. Um, there's a called Parkinson's Law. Look, if you set a goal, be careful, it might, you might hit it, mm -hmm. right? If you set your goal too low, careful, you might hit it. No matter what your goal is, like the work occupies all the space inside the time. I think that's what Parkinson's law is, um, something like that. In any case, um, if you set high goals the way that, I'm sorry, Vinny, Vinny. Vinny said, um, then you might just inspire the teams to think a little bit more cleverly. If you say, hey, we can probably do this, what if we try to do more? It might make people think differently and all of a sudden see a path, see a solution, see some opportunity that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, so there's something about that. And it's, it's a human condition kind of a thing, right? If you just say, oh, just achieve this one goal and then you're done, then maybe you're not inspiring enough of the extra juices. Yeah. The interesting trick, and I know you're talking like way up here versus at a team or team of teams level, um, but the interesting trick is we want leaders to be aspirational, inspire team to like, let's climb the mountain together, you know, that whole bonding experience. Sure. I totally yeah. get that. But also if, if done wrong, it could become leaders demanding tons of overtime and everybody's like so stressed yes. out because they have to accomplish this because the leader said you had to. Yeah. So it's interesting in how, how you play the story about it to teams to make, yeah, make sure really it is nice. aspirational and not, and not killing. Yeah, that's a great observation. Yeah. I ask a question, a clarifying question here, Brian. I'm curious because we're talking about aspirational objectives. And I wonder if there's a difference between aspirational objectives and aspirational key results. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Because I wonder if an aspirational objective can be 
aspirational, but the key result maybe is a little more realistic so that we don't create a, a culture of fear, a culture of overtime, a culture of I'm not hitting any of my goals. I wonder if there's a, a, a difference between objective and key result. Yeah, and it, it is the combination of the two. That's why it's one acronym, right? OKR. They're meant to go together. If you set gigantic, impossible goals, you can burn out your teams. But when it's coupled with Okay, we're we're gonna land on Mars someday, and SpaceX is literally trying to do that, I believe, right? But today, we just need to get this one rocket working well. Like for the next three months, if we get one rocket working well, and then we put twenty-seven of them together, maybe we'll get to Mars someday. But like that might take us years and years and years. But that's that that vision for years and years from now is on the walls of the building, right? This is what we're this is where we're going. This is our North Star, and then the KR keeps us focused and grounded and align so that we're all marching the same direction so we know what the heck we're doing and it doesn't get lost, right? So that's the other thing is that a lot of people, the bigger the company is, the bigger the chance a random team member has no idea why they're there. They have no idea what their work accomplishes or what goals it sets or what customer it impacts or anything. And they feel like a cog in a machine, right? But like if we have alignment where we know I'm working on the rocket that's going to get us to Mars. All of a sudden, you love your job more. You might even care more. You might do better work or be more clever in your job because you know how it's connected to the end goal. So there's something really powerful about that with OKRs as well. And like Jeff, Jeff says, it is the combination of the KRs. So um, I skipped over the question about timeline. Um, well, let me go ahead and ask that anyway. Is, does it, um, what timelines have you seen? If you've used OKRs before, someone says, how long should it take us to accomplish this aspirational or attainable objective? Quarterly, a lot of times. The objective would be quarterly, okay. Annual. Annual? Annual? Annual, okay. I've seen a lot in the three to five year time range. Yeah, time, time so maybe they have like these uh, one, three, five year horizons. Mm -hmm. um, that's also really helpful, setting these big audacious goals, but kind of um, articulating when we think we're going to be able to achieve them. And you can have multiple objectives with different time frames. We depend a lot on the industry in a while. If you're in a really big company or you work on really complicated things, right? Like, I mean, the automobile industry, there's so many moving parts, literally, that uh, maybe it's hard to predict where you're going to be five years from now, or maybe they do. I don't know, but like it's the size of the problem, right? And the amount of work and the sort of the complexity of the solution that might end up dictating your sort of horizon. And it's meant to not be quite so exact, right? It's just like, this is the direction we're heading. The objective is literally just to guide, to point the team in the right direction. Then the KR is what focuses the work in the next three weeks to be iterative and to think about how we're going to get there today. And then you might change your mind in the next quarter and do something else, hitting things from different angles to still try and work on that same objective. Can I ask a clarifying question for that? I, you know, when I've seen organizations use OKRs or, or something similar, Brian, maybe you can comment on this as well. Um, but the, the objective doesn't change on a regular basis. The objective is to still increase market share or to increase customer satisfaction or become the, 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 the entertainment hub, right? Now, if, if you go back to Netflix's, uh, Net, Netflix's uh, uh, um, objective effectively was to be that entertainment, whatever their, their, their thing was um, that, uh, that, that they picked. Um, but that didn't change. The technology did. How they got there did. The focus from switching from DVDs to online streaming certainly changed. That was certainly dynamic, but the objective didn't change. And so I'm just wondering if you have an example of an industry or a company <coughs> where the objective of that company, the purpose, the raison d'etre of that company changes uh, significantly in a time frame of less than a year. And, and, and there could be. I'm just I'm curious. I don't know. A startup might pivot, for yeah. example. Yeah. There's, there's another, there's a missing component to this exact conversation, and it's at which level does that OKR live? And this is a really confusing thing. There's no real hard and fast rules. You can use OKRs at different levels. And so you could have a corporate OKR 
that says we're going to be the world's best mobile phone manufacturer, and maybe you just changed your mind on that last year. But you might, at the next divisional level, say we're going to improve customer service by 15% or something. And that's a different goal inside of dovetailing and coupled with the other layer of OKRs. So you could have a company OKR. You could have divisional OKRs. You could even have team of team OKRs. You can imagine them all sort of being dot connected to each other. And so, and the level of granularity or the scope of that objective is going to be drastically different depending on what level it lives in in the organization. Does that make sense? Is it confusing? Yes. I'm going to be a skeptic. Please do. Okay. I, I understand this. It, what you just said, just it sounds a little like you said it's cool and everybody's doing it now. It sounds a little bit like rebranded, you know, cascading objectives. It is. Yeah, yeah it okay. is. All right. Oh, what do you mean? more? Well, folks, I'm telling you this. So having the written a book, which is actually part of the purpose, which is actually some part of global OKRs. So tell tell you this. Objectives like increase sales by 20% are very poor objectives. And the OKR founder, John Doerr, basically doesn't like spare criticism on that. Uh, because, uh, like, what are we going to do with an objective like this? Uh, uh, bring your, you know, salespeople to offsite, give them a pep talk, and then come on, people, you can do it, <laughs> right? Uh, it's not going to be like, like, what are we going to do about it, right? So the way, uh, again, for for the long term, you succeed at this. You, for example, you're faster to market than your competitors then that translates to market share and that means money. Mm -hmm. You have some features in your product that your competitors don't. That translates into market share, that translates into money. You have some um, premium level non-functional quality in your product, which is by the way very hard to get. That means you, um, you may have the same market share or you may even have just a niche but these are really premium customers where profit margins are like 5x what your competitors are getting. And it means money. So all of these things are money, 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 uh, but you don't get to money directly. You get it through objectives such as at the level, which is not at the executive face on the cover of the business magazine, and it's not at the key level, but at someone like, you know, senior manager of IT infrastructure, slash mean time to repair by a factor of 10 in the next month, speaking of timelines. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't, 20% of our subscribers are unsubscribing. Mm -hmm. And there goes um, um, basically that big, huge, so ambitious can, goal. So, um, so and, and that's a measurable objective, right? Because, because that happens to be, let's say, a big real world example. A, uh, a key fitness criterion for some of our premium customers, we need to keep them, right? And that, 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 that's an objective, and it, it, there is, of course, a key result to it. Can, can I ask a question there? Because I, I, I conflated when you were talking there an objective and a key result, and it sounds like the objective is retain our customer base. Yes. The key result is reduce mean time to restore. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so of course it would be to retain uh, certain core customers and get them resubscribed to the next contract term. And, and of course, key result to that, but it takes some customer interest. You know what has to be done, um, right? So, um, so we cannot just uh, attain it by, by telling people, like, retain them at what cost, right? What are we going to do, grind them? <laughs> or, <laughs> it, it also sounds when you're saying, Alexi, that the money is actually the one way you're measuring. It's not. It's not objective in itself. It's actually showing because you're getting money after you've achieved the result. Uh, People, yeah, they're, they're showing that they value uh, it. Yeah, that's a that's a kind of secondary reward. Right. right. The primary reward is the business gets to survive. Right. Because it satisfies yeah. customers. It's well, and it and it reflects your company culture and what you're doing. I mean, if you. Were to ask, you know, Tony Shea what his objectives were 
when he was, you know, finding success with Zappos, right? He said he was uh, a customer service company that happened to sell shoes. And so I bet a lot of his measures are literally about the happiness of customers, about the seamlessness of returning goods, about, you know, getting repeat customers to come back to them and buy more products. Um, about trying to get them interested in buying things other than shoes, but primarily through making them happy and by talking to customers and using that feedback to drive the strategy of the company. So it depends on what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. Um, and a lot of the ideas that you just listed are fantastic, right? But how do you actually, uh, if you're you know reducing mean time to failure, if you, have a, if you have serious problems with that, then heck yeah, that should be the most important thing to the company right now. Otherwise, we're going to lose customers. It's all situational, right? What are you trying to accomplish? And as a good leader, whether you're at a senior level or a middle manager, you should know what the pulse of the company is and what the most important thing to do next. We hold our product owners and product managers responsible for what's most important inside of their products. But at a company level or at a divisional level inside of a company, they should have a strategic insight as to what the most important thing for us to do to move our Titanic through the icebergs. What are we doing differently this year that's going to make a difference? And, you know, big companies make big decisions all the time. Broadcom deciding to buy VMware. What was the strategic objective there? Are they just always trying to buy up more software companies? No, they're trying to make sure they only buy companies that have a 40% profit margin. And so they're constantly looking for companies that meet that criteria. And when they do, they, they pull the trigger on it. And so there's, you know, it's like, what are your objectives? What are you trying to do? What's the most important thing for you to do? Grow big to survive? Keep your customers happy? Fix all your production bugs? Depends on what you need. How is it different than a milestone? Um, you know, it's, milestone is like one of those loaded terms, right? Like it's just a diamond in a Microsoft project plan to me. But, no, I'm just kidding, right? It's, it's, it, <laughs> I'm just teasing. A milestone can be anything informally, right? You're trying to set a deadline for something. The assumption here with OKRs is that you have some sort of, it's probably fiscally generated, right? It's on an annual basis, on a quarterly basis. That's how they tend to align, especially with public facing companies. What are we doing with our money this year in order to make a difference, in order to grow, in order to do what we're trying to achieve? So you set these objectives along those lines. Um, and then milestones probably belong more on like a now, next, later kind of a product roadmap or something that's more product specific. So the key results should be, and that's a really good question. I think I even had a question about that in here somewhere. Um, if key results are about every, I'm going to say three months, and they should be specific and not aspirational, um, do they have to have a number? So let me select that question back to you all. So if a key result is, get more customer conversations, or if it's fix more production bugs. Um, so, all right, so you want to do a show of hands? Do you need to have a number on a KR to be specific? Yes? You say no. You say no. Why do you say no? So sometimes it can be uh, uh, expressed as the two products have sort of feature there, different sheets going so we launched a feature, could be a KR? Yes, but that would be, be one new feature. Or a specific it feature. It could be a specific one, it could be a batch of them. Okay, yeah. want some sort of three. Differentiating feature set. Yeah, we are going to be the first <laughs> we have wired no transfer of no. mobile blood. Hold on, first. Or, or, that was it, or it could be another thing is that if you consider that in a certain, let's say, market segment, you need to have a number of must haves. And so the fact is, are you competitive in this? Uh, are you competing in this market segment or are you not? Mm. Right? And, and that's basically a yes no fact. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a yes no. It's like a bully. It's it, a perfectly it, good but it is zero one. Zero one. Can't pull it down. Serving some software, right? Let's say the key is out here and you're saying you know it's a feature that new feature is the product that you've added. But that feature is adding something to what? It Why did we add that feature? Right, so the result is actually the end thing. So I, I mean, that's why I believe it should have a number. 
a feature if it's not serving your purpose for the organization in achieving the overall, you know, let's say that the production market share, then but, it's not the result so, as for me. So when you say number, but that's the thought I have to discuss. So when you say number, you're saying means value. In market share holder in the particular territory, then you know we need to add two features, three features, but that ultimately is leading to gaining that market share or improving ultimately the sales. So the result would be the sales, but not the feature if my team I see would so like that, to There's an abstract yeah. relationship <laughs> or a direct relationship. I think our point was that you could say we're going to launch our mobile app. That's like a, a milestone of a sort that say we're going to actually create value and do something. It's a boolean. Either we made it or we didn't make it in the next three months. I, I was just going to say I can't fathom how a feature could be a key result yeah. of any sort. You so, know, in fact, uh, knowing that you should make that feature, you know, there might be a journey of experimentation to even know if you should do that feature or not. And that should be toward achieving something, toward achieving a key result. So not delivering the feature it might be the right approach in this. So, uh, yeah. I think if we make it all of their features, then you're just creating a waterfall. So, geez, I don't know what you're doing. This. I have a question. I got these that. eight key results, you know, and, and so I want to get the first one and the next one. Right. So, you know, usually if there's existing measures, like we know how many sales and revenue and bugs and things that we can count already. But what if you're launching, this is the first time your company has ever launched a mobile app. You don't have any data. And the very first achievement is getting it out the door. So that's a Boolean. We either launched it or we didn't launch it. Is that, our, is that a key result underneath our, you know, improve our customer segmentation footprint? But what, what does it mean? Not generic, but it can be various. I mean, it's, it's too big of a thing. It, fine, but like... We, we, we might end up being able to find the one key result that's not quantifiable, but... It's a lot easier to harness. Yeah, and I think what you're getting at is if you can create measurable results, you should. They put numbers on them. Yes. So for launch the mobile app, I think that's great. I wonder if my key result would be launch the mobile app and have one user sign up to use it. It's yeah, worthy of a customer using it, and we actually get a customer to use it. Like Maybe to use it a second time, right? Because they might use it once and then never come back because it sucks. That, that's the more meaningful <laughs> version of the same thing. Yeah, I, I think it's more of a goal because, again, how do we make all of us understand exactly what it means and work toward that? So we need we need something. Well, that's remember, this is an inspirational strategic so, statement to say, it. we will launch a cover-facing mobile app in the Apple Store, period. Which is a great objective. Exercise left for the teams. No, the, so we will... We will um, we will attract college students to our, you know, um, loan company, and then we're going to do that this quarter by launching our first mobile app. That's your key result, a milestone. Do it or don't do it. And I think what Jeff's getting at is, well, let's have at least like a number of customers on there. If you can't come up with a measure otherwise, then maybe that's the only thing you have left. You should try and come up with a measurable, specific key result, a range. It went up, it went down a percentage, a dollar figure, something. Um, remember, that's still sort of a, a, a strategic statement. The exercise is still left for the team to decide what to do to launch and build and deploy and get it in front of customers. They still have to do all the things. Yeah. If it's possible to measure bullying or not. Yeah. Uh, as long as we... Yeah. That, that's exactly right. And there is meant to be this innovation space between the strategic statements of your objectives and key results and then allowing the teams, just like the user story, to actually figure out how to deliver against those and achieve those results. Yes, please. So how does the key result... So I'm coming back to the, does it have to be quantifiable question? Yeah. So in the context of you raised happiness earlier, like employee happiness as a key result, I'm curious, so... I, I'm sure there's quantifiable ways to do you know, surveys like metrics and satisfa yep. employee satisfaction rates. Like there, there are ways to quantify, but there I've also seen more kind of qualitative studies where it's indicators of behaviors and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that also comes to me as an example where it's not, it may not be. Quantified. Yeah, with something a little bit abstract like happiness, you do sort of have to invent some sort of a survey that gets to what you really want to measure. 
so it does. So I'm I'm kind of curious about the consensus on this conversation, just from a curiosity level. Like, mm. is, so is does that fall in the area of like it may not quantify this, or it may be okay to have bubble fuck like more kind of. How would you do that? Can you think of an example about how to do something that's more abstract? That's not a survey result. Like you got a, you know, an NPS uh, score of, you know, greater than seven. That means your team's happy or your customers are happy. How else could you do it? Well, it's not a measure. That was kind of my question. Like in that case, like the only thing I can think of is like indicators of maybe behaviors, like behavioral changes. Oh, okay. So if they're that's happy, the then they do these things and measure those things. Right. Or maybe there were indicators that you saw on the team. Maybe it is behavioral that you notice that suggests to you that have changed. Mm. That's kind of what you wanted to change. On the team. So I, I'm almost kind of raising that question back. Then. That's good. If I may. The way I would ask, I'm trying to understand what you're trying to ask is, so are we agreeing on, does it have to have a number? Of yes, numbers? exactly. <laughs> That's my question. So let me just think on team happiness yeah. for a moment. Um, and, and one of the worries I have of team happiness is this idea of trying to take something complicated or complex and simplify it by converting it into a single number. And that can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. So a metric that I might use for team happiness is a heat map. Heat maps are not single numbers, but rather they show a range of, of colors. And that may or may not be appropriate in your context, but it might be a way that you decide to measure team happiness in your environment today. Whether or not that's right, I don't know, but it's a way of not having a single number because it's it, a, a single number could be a dangerous thing. And it could hide all sorts of variation in those numbers. And so maybe we find a way to use something like a heat map. Or an AI smile detector. <laughs> you, you know, just, just quickly on that, one of the ladies that I worked with, yeah, yeah. A, a lady that I worked with actually wanted to measure team happiness by the number of, number of smiles per employee per day. Oh, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a joke. She never really wanted to measure it, but she wanted to instill that sort of thinking in in the in in the way she wanted to create a joyous work environment and so that was her fun way of, of turning it in it never was a real metric by the way so a lot of fake smiles yeah 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 I, I guess my question is to answer what you're saying are we consensus on is it a number or not and I'm trying to understand what Lexi was saying as well I, I've often in, in my work talked about something that's observable so you, you mentioned fact you can point to it and say, yeah, that happened, which is where that Boolean thing comes in. But it, it, it has to be not subjective. So that's how I would maybe answer that question. You have to be able to say, yeah, that, that happened. That number was reached. You have to reached. say whether we achieved it or yeah. not. Yeah, I mean, so, so it's that's, be that's if that, there's yeah. a way to say yes for sure if that happened or not. Yeah. That's I, what I think. I'm just trying like, to connect the ideas together. The key results are supposed to be showing us whether or not we're making progress toward the objective. Yes. Yeah, you write them in that way so that it's representing kind of a path toward the objective. So it takes some cleverness, right? To write the right so measurable, measurable measurable or not, number or not, does it indicate progress toward exactly. the goal? Yes. So I, I might say I want to get over there to that chair. I take three steps. I don't know the distance between here and the chair. Does it look like I'm closer? If it looks like I'm closer, then I'm probably getting better, closer right, to my objective, right. right? So I might not be able to actually. Yeah, and sometimes it's not way. obvious, right? Like yeah. Maybe it's literally impossible to go that way, yeah. and you have to spend your next three months working your way to dig through this wall right. <laughs> to be able to get so, over there later. Yeah. That's the only way to get there. And it might be weird, like, why are you digging through the wall? Because well, I couldn't go to direct that. Right. So it's progress towards the goal. And that's really what we're trying to do. You have to be clever about the way you write these things to set the direction. Because remember, the OKRs are meant to inspire the teams to do the right work, to keep them focused on the right things that are meaningful for the company's progress. Everything should be related. However you decide to measure them, hopefully with numbers, but whatever, as long as it's meaningful and the teams can then um, pick that up and define the right epics and stories to actually help achieve those results, I think that's the ultimate goal, is to make sure that we're setting the right curves of the road. We're saying this is what's important to us, is to try and actually make progress against these big picture things. Make sense? Any other questions, thoughts? Um, I have a question about the 
for something that I used to ever use and I think very well, I plan to call. So then we follow on Rockstar to the smart phone. But while on the journey, you're still looking at the star, which is objective. How will you will you feel that? Well, from Toronto, when what are the cities when I reach I validate that these are these are the right direction to reach now? So why else Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I was supposed to go uh, not for, but I'm in Vancouver. That is not my key result that I was hoping for. Let's drop it somewhere else and it will go. Yeah. It's a good way to start. Yeah. Yeah. Also, this may be again like a more elementary question, but coming back to vision, uh, sorry, not vision, objectives. Uh -huh. If it's more of an aspirational objective, I'm also kind of curious, like almost like the milestone versus key results question. What is the 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 distinction is like I, I'm almost seeing it as objective as if it was a hierarchical. It should feel like, a little bit like that, right? Yeah. Because of the timelines and the perspective, right? So if the objective is a big audacious goal we're trying to accomplish in the next one, three years, um, uh, then uh, your KRs are what are the baby steps we're going to take to get there? And it might be in a three month increment yeah. along the way. And every three months, you pause and go, are we still heading in the same direction? Do we want to do more of this? Do we want to continue to try and sell more books in Canada? Oh, we're good enough with what we've done? Then let's pick the next most important thing to do in the next three months. What's easy? Uh, KR with, it, with a milestone because, yeah, they're, 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 they're very different. And if you start to get to milestones or we start to have this conversation about, you know, a roadmap, I mean, we are then heading straight toward a waterfall approach, right. you know, and so... Uh, you know, if your KRs are, first one takes me from here to here, next one takes me from there to there, next one takes me from there to there, that, those are not KRs at all, I wouldn't think. I, I think you're right about that. I don't think that, that you know, your KRs can be completely unrelated to each other uh, in any way, shape, or form, you know, uh, so, uh, and, and they can be done by different teams. What's that? How do you know the effectiveness of your KRs? Well, no, no, the, the effectiveness is the KR, right? You, you, you defined it and you're trying to see do we meet that objective or not. Uh, I, I can give you an example. Uh, just, uh, a company that, that wanted to, uh, I, I don't want to get into the details because it'll take too long, but, but there were, were a number of things that, that, that a number of different unrelated things that, that they wanted to try that they thought would each one might take the organization a little bit closer, but they were not sequential. They were not building on each other. One of them had to do with changing the mailing, you know, things that were mailed out, you know, and, and so they were trying to make sure that if we, you know, can we improve X by improving our mailings? Another one was related to software, you know, how can we make something easier? How can we measure that it was easier? Because we think making it easier feeds into this higher objective, you know, and so there were a, a large number of things that, that were very measurable and where they had a target for, for that, but that they were unrelated to each other. And that's why, you know, I would say there are different facets of the big picture. Completely different. For uh, the milestone, you think of, like you said, the diamond on the Microsoft project plan. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all what, what, a, what a KR is, I don't yeah. So you're right. So the right way to teach KRs is that there are specific measurable goals along the path to make progress against the big picture objective. And you should be trying to put measurements on them if you can. Uh, but it should be an exception. I wanted to pick up right with something. Um, I don't know if Cheesy said it specifically, but there's something he was hinting at in the conversation with objectives and key results. And it's this idea that one objective has multiple key results. And don't think of those things as tasks or epics. In fact, they can be experiments. You don't know which of those things is going to actually turn into the right thing to help you make the next progress against that big goal. Does it make sense? Um, and you can imagine, you know, that in order to achieve some big picture goal like that, you might have people in sales trying something, people in delivery trying something, somebody trying to tighten up the website, somebody sending better direct mail, whatever those things are can all be related to the same objective. And you don't know. You, three months later, you go, you know what? Those mailers sucked. 
We didn't get any new customers whatsoever. We're trying to improve our customer reach and nobody opens their mailbox anymore. Maybe we have to do something else. And so an ex uh, KR can be proven wrong early. And there's something powerful about that to make sure that you're thinking about all the ways that you want to ask the teams to try to actually make progress against this big goal. You're setting direction. You're the general of the army saying, go take the hill. I don't care how you get there, but that's what I want you to try and do. See if you can figure it out. And it might take a bunch of different ideas in order to get there. Mm. Because at the end of the day, you want to know that you know a K, a KR made it, and then maybe after the, that. Place. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And every three months, you should pause, measure, and reflect to say which ones are working, and are these things still important to us? Did we only get halfway there? One of the questions I was going to ask at the end of that last set was, you know, what if what if you don't achieve the KRs? What if you came up with this great plan and you don't achieve any of your KRs? Do people start getting fired? Obviously. If you have the right culture, you don't. You celebrate the progress, Jeff. You celebrate the fact that you set the right curbs of the road and that the team was making progress. You didn't get to Mars yet, but at least you built that one rocket. <laughs> Failure is learning. No, I, I get it. I get it. And and there's a maturity level in an organization to be able to deal with these things properly. Yeah. Right. If I read up about OKR, would it be written like in some of the original literature that says hitting something between 60 and 80 percent of your KRs on a quarterly basis is actually great? That you, you shouldn't be getting 100 percent of your KRs. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think there's um. There's probably a lot of data out there that says people fail a lot, but they learn a lot and then they adjust. Um, I worked with um, a team that was um, in between the consumer banking group and the wealth group focused on this astute and affluent market segment. These are people that have six figures of cash in their savings and checking accounts and whatever and are looking to figure out what to do with their money. They're like this great target customer segment at the, the bank that we worked at. Um, and I was working with the leader there, and her job was to try and grow the segment, try and find a way to make it work. And they tried all kinds of things to figure out how to convert these users into um, wealth customers, trying to actually open new accounts. And they experimented with all kinds of things. And stuff didn't work all the time. Or they, try, they set some big goal because they didn't know what they're doing. They're being sloppy. They're just completely imperfect. They're trying to you know, convert 10% of them to create new accounts or something. And they made like 3%. But she was a really wise leader. And she said, you know what? We made progress. This is something where we can say, we can tweak this. We can use our learnings to come up with better OKRs, to come up with the right direction to go forward next quarter. And so I would hope that you would run into leaders that would kind of lead that way as well that there was a whole bunch of prerequisite work that needed to be done in order to even get to the point that they made this 3% gain. And that was worthwhile work. The team was focused. One of the benefits that we don't talk about is the fact that the folks on the team, the individual team members, when they know why these OKRs are in place and they know what their KR measures are, they're the people that raise their hand when some schmuck of a middle manager comes in and asks them to do something else. They go, hey, why am I being asked to do this weird piece of work that doesn't align with the OKRs that we've agreed to do? All of a sudden, you have this great focus where people don't get distracted. You need some psychological safety there, obviously, to help people say that. But when big bosses say, these are the OKRs, this is the where I want you to march, and then the teams of teams go, okay, we know what we got to do. We're going to build these things and write these epics and write these stories. And that's how we're going to experiment to see if we can achieve these results. And somebody says, hey, can you go do the flippity job with the wicked me wizard? And you're like, what? Why would we do that? We're trying to do this stuff that we all agreed was the most important stuff to do. So that's the alignment part that's really powerful with the characters. Everybody in every team knows why they exist.
You see the purpose. God, there's so many people still doing that. But I've seen this work. I've seen the power of this, where um, a, a release train with 18 teams in it got broken into four different release trains and, you know, decommissioning systems, building new stuff, trying to make their customer service smarter, all in the same vein, in the same area of the company, had divisional OKRs. They wrote their team of team OKRs and then asked the teams to write their own ethics designed around how to achieve those results. And it was like, it, I mean, it was ugly PowerPoint and spreadsheets and a bunch of mess, but it was beautiful how orchestrated it was. So I've seen it, it can work. Um, and, and I did see people raise their hand and say, this is dumb. Why are we trying to do this? I thought we're trying to get off of this old system so that we can use this new system to accomplish this other big goal. Like that's more important than me fiddling around with this other thing. And empowering people to say that stuff all of a sudden can be a dramatic shift in culture. Um, all right, so what else are we going to do? We're going to talk about these questions. What else did I didn't come up with? How many layers? I should have asked this question earlier. I would have added a little bit of clarity about what the heck are these OKRs, how many different places that might they exist. So if you see my, my list there, company level, division level, department level, team of teams, all the way down to the team, or maybe even individuals are creating their own objectives and key results. How many do you think is the magic number? How many layers would you create if you were the big boss in a company? What do you think the right answer is? As many as are needed, but no more. Okay. Okay. As few as possible. Yeah. Yeah, because if it's just like one gigantic one for the whole company and you got 30,000 employees, too much, too vague, too much left for chance. Maybe, maybe two layers, maybe something that creates some clarity, sets direction, allows individual departments to declare their own sort of goals. The other obvious answer is not everybody has to use it in the company, right? It can, and, and a lot of places are doing this already. Um, I'm constantly reminded of the Kurt Vonnegut quote, right? The future is here already. It's just unevenly distributed. And it's okay if your company is like that too. And there's modernization happening over here and, you know, diamond milestones and project plans over here. It's fine. It's like it, it doesn't matter how you work, right? You can always get a little bit better. And if the, the you see some successes in a company, it becomes contagious. I heard about those folks over there. They set some strategic goals, and you know what? They didn't meet them, but by God, were they focused, and they got something done that no one's ever done before in three months. It's really powerful when that happens, and then it's like, spreads like wildfire. Somebody else goes, maybe we should try that. What's the most successful pattern? Yeah, I, I think so. And what I've seen is that um, rarely do you get clarity at the company level. It's it's there's a vision statement, right? Be the best community bank we can be. Wahoo, right? But it doesn't tell people what to do. And so you get down to a divisional or department level. That adds directional clarity about what the work is. And so if you have those aspirational goals and key results, then that creates meaning in your area of the company. The marketing people know what they're doing. The technology people know what they're doing, et cetera. And then if you have these team of teams doing it, and, and maybe they're not structured that way, but most places have some collections of teams of teams, whether they call them release trains or not, I don't care. But like, you know, these eight teams are trying to deliver some big system or decommission a bunch of systems and build new ones or whatever the heck they're doing. If they have their own OKRs, then that inspires the teams beneath them to stay focused and not go running in 10 different directions. I remember actually, Right at COVID hit, you were in New York at the Business Agility Conference, and there was this presentation. I was, I attended remotely. There was this slide that said, 
What happens at the company or division level typically is they create an initiative, they create a project mm -hmm. in order to achieve that objective. Like they, they, at the top level, they are thinking that way. But then what happens is the teams get cascaded down the initiative. And so the team's goals become finish this initiative, mm -hmm. not actually achieve the okay. Yeah, and, I, I, and which is it goes back to waterfall and and yeah, it can easily devolve, right? Yeah. You, there's it's an art, form. like the, it's the connection between that top yes. level and the lower levels. That's I think the magic sauce. Yeah, and and it's absolutely in the words. There, I mean, you can fit a company's OKRs on just a couple of pieces of paper, but the words you put there are very important to set the direction. And you're right, it can devolve into age-old waterfall. And people start with KRs, they smell like tasks or something. It's like, no, it has to be an achievement, it has to be an outcome, it has to be whatever is meaningful for the strategic direction. All right, you guys are awesome. We could talk about these kinds of things all night. The one thing that I wanted to try and do before we all run out of time and have to go drink beer is, um, whatever, um, I'd love to see if we can't brainstorm a little bit, maybe around the different groups that we have. Um, I put my cheesy definition of the agile mindset up there we think about not it's not cheesies <laughs> but you're welcome to steal it because that's all agile coaches do is steal shit from each other right <laughs> damn I, the one smart thing i did is going to be stolen given to somebody else that's fine you're welcome man but, um i say that word all the time i don't and i don't mean you um to see if you can't think about the conversation that we had about OKRs, objectives, key results, the behaviors that it creates, the work products, the, the strategies, the thinking, the outcomes, the stuff that it does to the teams who are actually trying to use this tool. How does it reinforce aspects of the Agile mindset? I'm pretty darn sure I did not do a great job of communicating that. So I'm asking you to stretch your minds a little bit to see if any of this makes sense. I, I give the, the no-brainer, I'll give you the easy one, it's the iterative mindset. By having quarterly goals, we have to make baby steps of progress in order to achieve the big picture. And we get to change our mind every, whatever, three months. Is this working or not working? Does this experiment work or not? Do we achieve this thing or not? Do we want to keep trying to do this or not? And change our mind about the next step. And that's an iterative approach at a sort of macro level above the teams. So what else? What else could people do? What what lives inside of OKRs that can help reinforce things? Maybe maybe the last one, like like you said, if if we have the right system, then yeah, you know, anyone in the organization can come and say that's not connected to my to our my objective <coughs> or to our key results. So yeah. let's stay focused. Yeah. Let me think back on that one. Okay. Maybe the last one you talked about psychological safety, but what about <coughs> cultural learning? Yeah. Yeah. It's safety for me to say, hey, I fail, but I learn. Yes. And then in the, the, for the cultural learning is... is getting and to appreciate the learning. Appreciate yeah. And leadership also, hey, hey don't, don't look at us as a failure. It's a win. Because you learn about it. Yeah. And I'm learning to the next level. What can we capitalize on that? And then spin out a positive thing. So, yeah. To your point, since I can do safety, on top of that, cultural learning. Yeah. And I, 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 yeah, I love that. You know, there's something um, somebody smarter than me came up with this phrase, and it was like a light bulb went off in my head. So if you stop saying the word requirement and instead say hypothesis, all of a sudden you're shifting your own mindset. You're expecting it to either fail and learn something, or to be successful and have data that proves it. And so that's also a focus on learning. It's also a focus on experimentation. And the KRs are exactly that. They're many experiments. They're many hypotheses. We think if we get more customer visits, it might lead to more revenue. And then we'll see if it did or not. I did accidentally. Sorry, I'm giving away the answer. I, I see the experimentation goes and we can decide if it works. Okay. What do you mean by that? Uh, if you, you know, we, we have a, a key result. But how do I know what's the right way to do that? I can run lots of experiments and learn, you know, what I, you know, and to kind of sneak into that. So, for example, earlier yeah. we were talking about the idea of 
you know, getting a, a mobile app out was the, was the KR. Well, I would want to do a lot of experiments ahead of time to make sure that the mobile app was the right thing. To make sure that yes. Right, so. Okay. Many experiments inside of it. Okay. Cool. That's good. Well, Sam, you have a challenge with uh, customer centric. Yeah, so all right, so let's talk about customer centric first. That's a little bit easier. Who can who can add something to that? But it seems to me a lot of the objectives are at a higher level and a lot of them are a lot about company purpose and for organizational purpose and obviously your company exists for customers to some extent or to service its customers. Yeah. And so you're kind of relating the purpose of your company to why it is you exist and what you're trying to service. Right. Yeah, most vision statements don't, don't say we make lots of money. <laughs> they talk about what they do for their customers, right? Yeah. And the other thing is also the, the fact that it's so centered around results, right? So you have to see something change somewhere. And yeah. Most of the time it will be connected to your customer or your product. Or, so th that connection between a goal or a huge vision and results. Keep, keep yeah. Results. Yeah. We have to look at results to see if our, it mattered to our customers. There's a feedback loop there, and the customers are part of that feedback loop. Okay. I'm working with a very large organization right now. You may have heard of them. Um, it's uh, the federal government. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I am in the point right now where everybody is busy and running like chickens with their heads cut off. They are all busy. They are all working on a whole pile of things. And I am having a fantastic time. I don't know if they are, but I am having a fantastic time because all I'm doing right now is saying, why are we doing this? And it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> Nobody knows why we're doing any of these things. And so they tell me, well, because um, Billy told me we have to. Okay, but why is that important to Billy? Well, because it's going to make... And eventually we get to the fact that somehow it's going to make the Canadian transportation sector safe, or it's going to reduce accidents on waterways. But it takes about weeks for me. <laughs> oh, it's way more than five. I wish it was five. But it takes it, it takes ages for me to, to help people see that. And then uh, I had one gentleman. I said, "Why are we doing this?" He had no idea. And I said, "Well, what happens if we stop?" And and so the idea of I haven't told them about OKR, so I have not used that language because they don't need another framework or another set of acronyms. Uh, but the thinking that goes into behind it of what objective do we have and what's our key result for it is in the back of my mind trying to coach them through why are we doing the work that we are doing, why should the taxpayers be funding this, is an absolutely phenomenal question to ask public servants. Why are we investing taxpayer money in, in doing this? And so talking about customer focus, and that's a very different type of customer than many of us deal with in the public service because customer, I mean, you don't have a choice, you're going to pay your taxes or we're going to come get you. Um, so, so it's very different, but, but when we think about the service that we are providing to the Canadian taxpayer or the, to, to, to Canada, is a very different type of conversation and it's interesting when people start to think about why they're doing their work, why it matters and what the impact it's going to have, which does tie into that customer-centric um, mindset as to why we're actually doing this thing in, in the first place. And I think there's a lot in OKRs that gives us the opportunity, and I don't think, and I, I just, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to shut up. Um, not like it. No. Um, but um, I, I think there's there's an important distinction because we talked about the fact that you know that you probably don't have one key result to achieve an objective, and I think it's important that not every key result is necessarily 100% customer focused. There are going to be things that you may do internally, but I think if you keep that mindset of that, that customer centricity um, at, at the focus, many of your KRs will be customer focused which will uh, ultimately help you hopefully achieve the objective that you're looking for, but I don't think all of them necessarily will. Yeah, and I don't hear it in I got the customer, like I said, now let's move into product culture. Mm -hmm. I would like to get mm -hmm. that inside. Because so let me, I, I'm, Apparently, I'm not going to shut up. Um, <laughs> traditionally, when you think about large organizations, they will fund a project. And a project, by its definition, has a defined start and a defined end, and it builds something new that hasn't been created before. Mm -hmm. That is the definition of a project. Mm -hmm. And yet we know in software development and in many of the, the, the knowledge type of environments uh, that, that we work in, is that we may build something new, but it doesn't actually go away until we deprecate the product, until mm -hmm. we sunset it. There's always maintenance. There's always enhancements that can be had for it. 
And when we start to use key results to talk about the, um, the outcome that we are looking for and, and how it's going, to, it's going to impact or move us toward that objective, we stop thinking about we're going to fund this project for a period of time and we're going to achieve this key result by focusing on the different products that we have. And so I think it changes our mindset or it may change the mindset of moving away from uh, we're going to build the thing, new thing, and then we're never going to touch it again. And it reminds us that, that no, that thing is going to have to live throughout, and maintenance and ongoing advancements are going to continue to be a part of, of that thing that may, may be important for us. That is, that is so, subtle, though, right? So, so we're basically saying, saying it shifts the culture of the company to think more about their products as long-lasting, long-lasting product teams, long-lasting products and delivery, focus for different customer segments. You have to shift your thinking. If, if you're gonna become an agile company and get to business agility, you have to start thinking about products as long-term things, not a spaghetti mess of projects. And OKRs is just one small, subtle facet that might help a company start thinking about that because of the language you use in writing those strategic statements. But it is kind of abstract. It is kind of a little bit, it's not super direct. So you're right to point that out. Um, I did have a picture of like a bunch of example, uh, just to show the visual relationship of like OKR. So you could have an objective with multiple, here's experiments. Maybe if we get off of old platforms and decommission them, maybe that'll help us achieve this big result of servicing our customers better. Maybe if we figure out a way to need less time to train up new employees, maybe that'll help us. And so these were experiments that my client tried. And you know, reducing complaints turned out to be the thing that was maybe the, 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 had the biggest impact on actually improving our, our customer service feedback loop. Uh, but it inspires the teams to decide what they're actually doing and how they're gonna end up writing their epics and stories to try and actually create the right work to achieve the right outcomes following the right experiments. Um, there's a lot of words in that slide, so this is basically the same kind of a thing. Um, you have to do this whenever Jeff's on the team. Um, having a vision allows you to create multiple objectives with multiple key results. It's showing a one to three ratio. There's no exact science here. Three to five, not more than a couple objecti objectives. Keep it simple, keep it clear, make it important, and focus. Create the curves of the road. And then that inspires the teams to deliver the right work. Maybe it helps just pull some of this stuff visually together. Um, yeah. Thanks for touching it, Jeff. Um, so I think we covered a lot of the stuff that I wanted to talk about. This has been a really lively conversation. I mean, we only have a few minutes left, but we can talk more if other questions come up. Anyone wants to? Something we didn't cover well enough? Okay. I'm a lot of what's coming to me right now, a couple of things is around the further away you are from the customer in these large organizations or federal government, mm -hmm. the harder it is to know what the purpose that you have is. And it's it's like another way of thinking about it is a follow the money. Like where is your value? As in, you know, I'm serving this, I'm serving this, I'm serving this, which is eventually helping drive customer happiness or whatever else. And so it's that's kind of what's coming up for me in these conversations, that each one of us should know how we, yeah, and what's our purpose in the value. It's you're you're reminding me of just how hard it is to help a brand new company work with OKRs for the first time. A lot of times they just say, all right, well, what the heck are we doing now? Let's just write it down. <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you doing these things? And ask those questions like Jeff was just saying. And eventually you'll get to that why we do this because of this, because of this, because of this, and that achieves this big picture outcome. You can kind of translate a company's existing mess of work. You could literally walk in as a consultant We're and try to help them write what their OKRs would have been to create the craziness they have. What's interesting that most companies don't realize, um, and that we didn't mention at all this whole talk yet, is that Everyone knows that an individual can only do so much work, right? A team can only accomplish so much work. But companies forget that they have whip limits too. Yeah. You can't support 92 strategic capabilities and products to the market. Yeah, I'm capital one would disagree with you. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad we disagree too. <laughs> I know, I know. And they fail. 
feel miserably yeah. trying yeah. to do that. So it's interesting. If you do this well, it, it puts a spotlight on just the stuff that's being done and not being done and not being done well. Um, and so um, companies have width limits, and this is a great way to, to help you know, illuminate that. So, Brian, thank you so much for coming up all the way from Ohio just to, to meet with us tonight. He came all the way from I thought he came from Buffalo. Yeah, I'm Buffalo. He's Buffalo. Really, really appreciate you coming out, and thanks for the conversation tonight. Uh, I don't know about anyone else, but I learned lots, and I love hearing, uh, love hearing the stories and, and uh, hearing from everyone. So thank you, everyone, for contributing to the conversation.